Hi everybody, this is David Weiss. Thank you for joining us at Sonic Scoop. Insert logo here. It is not often that you get to put a face on a DAW. We're going to do that by interviewing Justin Frankel, who is one of the creators of Reaper, or are you the creator? I'm the original creator, but whatever. Well, the first thing I want to ask you about is when did you discover that you had a talent for coding? Um, I think when I was in high school, I started um, programming for fun, and uh, and the first sort of really validating experience was writing software for other students to use in school. Um, and at the time, we had a this was back in the '90s. We had a Novell network that um, all the students could use to run like WordPerfect 5.1 for DOS and things like that. And uh, one of the projects I made was uh, an email program that we could all use to uh, send email from student to student within the school. And uh, producing that and getting feedback from, from other students as users uh, was a, a very rewarding experience for me. Yeah, now were you a musician too at the time? Uh, not, not in high school, no. Uh, I didn't really get interested in, in playing music until uh, about 2001. Okay. So. All right, but something important happened for you musically before 2001, uh, which was in the late 90s, Justin and a partner of his, uh, or a couple of partners, right? Uh, well, I, I wrote software called Winamp right. uh, in the 90s, and, uh, and in 1999, uh, at the peak of the dot-com boom, uh, sold it to AOL. Right. And so I, I worked for AOL. Winamp was one of the earliest MP3 players. And, uh, and so I worked at AOL for f about five years on that. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I left, uh, I, I developed a, an interest in making music as, as opposed to just listening to it. Right. And uh, so then that's uh, how Reaper came about to be. Right. I want to flash back uh, sure. for a second with Winamp. Um, when, when you originally designed it, and for those who don't know or remember what Winamp was a big deal when it came out because it was a really easy to use media player and it was something that everybody needed uh, and what actually inspired you to create Winamp at the time? Um, yeah there was uh, there were other mp3 players out uh, for Windows but none of them sort of had the, the things that I really wanted to use like uh, the ability to do playlists uh, the ability to visualize the music as you're listening to it, um, things like that. Right, right. Um, and so it was really about the experience and about having it be something that you want to use and have it be uh, an interactive thing as opposed to just simply playing back MP3 files. It was more about you know, doing more things with them, things right. that we take for granted today. But at that point, it was, uh, it was a new thing. When Winamp uh, was acquired that was a multi-million dollar deal with AOL, uh, a big stock deal, uh, and you got absorbed into AOL uh, for, for a while, for a few years. Um, what were your takeaways, both good and bad, uh, from, from that whole experience, from being acquired, from getting you know, sucked up into a big company, not to be pejorative? Well, you know, I, I, uh, I went to college for less than a year uh, before I left and, and made Winamp. Um, and so I look at AOL as sort of like my college years uh, in terms of learning a lot about like working with other people and, and working in a big company. And uh, when I left, I came away from it wanting to avoid that in the future, wanting to just make things for the sake of making them and not have to make them, uh, not have to constantly justify everything with business decisions or with business motivations. So uh, the, the ability to just make software for the, for the purpose of making it and for the, the, the end goal of making something that's really uh, powerful and, and uh, enjoyable to use and not having to sort of go and think about monetization mm -hmm. and all these things. That was sort of where I came away from it. Did the creation software feel like an expression to you? Yeah, um, I, I, I mean, you have discussions with people about what makes art art versus, you know, is carpentry art? In many instances, it is. Uh, but the the question of function is is an issue. But uh, you know, things that that are art are not supposed to have function. But uh, but personally, I think that things can have function and be art because there are things that you craft and you try to make them the the, the nicest, most 
beautiful thing that you can. And so for me, yeah, it's uh, programming, writing software is, is really like an art. So then in 2004 is when you started working on Reaper in, in earnest, right? And then in 2005 it was released as freeware. Uh, 2005 I started. Uh, oh, okay. Before that I, I did some other experiments with uh, some like guitar effects processing. And, right. Um, things like that. And, uh, and, uh, and at that time I was doing recording using software like Logic and uh, Vegas. Um, and then I sort of got a little bit frustrated with the way that things were done with them. So I, mm -hmm. I started uh, working on something, a tool for my own use. Right. Um, I think it's very interesting that frustration often is the core of invention. They say necessity is the mother of invention, but it seems like frustration often is as well. In what ways were those DAWs frustrating you and how did you resolve to do it better with Reaper? Well, I, I started using Logic and uh, and the thing about Logic was is that it was incredibly powerful, but there were all these things happening behind the scenes that I could never figure out what was happening. So things would you would set it up and things would work, and then you would want to change something, and it was just very difficult to figure out how you would do that. Um, and you would try things, and they wouldn't have the effect that you thought they would, and, and things like that. So on, on the very basic level, it, it met the needs, but then it, it just also sort of failed me as I tried to, to do more complex things. Um, and then I started using Vegas, which was made by Sonic Foundry at the time, and since Sony bought. And uh, it actually, I, I, worked, I really liked Vegas, and it was a big influence in terms of how Reaper initially functioned. Um, but uh, Vegas became uh, more of a video editor than than an audio editor, and um, and it never uh, it may have been by this point, but it didn't have MIDI support. It didn't have virtual instrument support. It was really about using it as a tape machine. Um, so that sort of became a, a limitation uh, that I was interested in, in uh, doing other things with. And they had Acid at the time, which was a separate composition tool. Um, which, you know, using both of those is not really the best workflow, uh, probably. Right. It wasn't for me, anyway. Sure. So, uh, so, so Vegas ended up influencing a lot of what I did after that. Um, so now, switching gears here, what advice do you have for young entrepreneurs that might be seeing this? They want to make a, you know, they want to make a dent in audio. Uh, you know, what do you want them to know about going for it? I, I would say that if you have something that you want, you should, and, and you can't find something to do what it is you want, then you should make it. Um, that's the biggest, the biggest uh, thing, is, is figuring out what it is you want. And if you can do that and you can figure out a way to make it or approximate what it is you want, then, I, then you're in good shape because probably there, there would be some other people out there like you who, who would share the, the same desire. Right, okay. Um, it, so it's really that simple. Think about just, That's the way I operate anyway. I'm sure there are many you know, examples of counter to that. Right. Uh, but uh, that, that's, the way I, that's the way I roll. Was that what you were thinking when you put together Winamp? Yeah, I mean, Winamp was, it wasn't supposed to be, the fact that I sold it to AOL was just this random luck. It had, there was no point in my writing of it where I was like, oh yeah, this is gonna be huge. Uh -huh. like, never, never occurred to me and it never, I, and it was never something I really wanted. It was more of just a, an opportunity that I stumbled into. Who are some other innovators out there, uh, whether we're talking music or anything else, that, that you admire from the present or from the past? Um, I, always, um, I always was a big fan of John Carmack, who uh, was the main programmer at id Software that made Doom and Quake and Wolfenstein and all of these games and uh, he's always been someone I look to as like someone who's making excellent code and, and also sort of being successful doing that, uh, though in a very different way. Sure. Yeah. Give me one more. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay, here's one for you. Uh, Monty from ziff.org, I assume it's ziff, X-I-P-H, however you pronounce that. Okay, uh, X-I-P-H dot org. Dot org. He developed Vorbis, uh, and uh, there they have a new codec called Opus, which actually Reaper 5 supports as well. Um, he's always been someone who's been just so, like, such a positive contribution to technology and uh, 
the culture of technology with, that I, I've been always impressed with the work he does. He also has an interesting page talking about the uh, about high sample rates and whether or not they're actually meaningful. Right, right. Um, though it focuses more on for listening to music as opposed to recording music, which are obviously very different requirements. Um, but it's uh, yeah, he's a he's someone who's been very influential. How do you filter out what is important and what is not when it comes to recording good audio? Um, how do I personally, or how does one? Well, because I, I have a very low standard. Like I, yeah. I produce songs, uh, and I spend maybe a half hour on them, and then I'm like, all right, I'm done. And um, but you know, a lot of people, most people, spend a lot more time and, and uh, have a much better attention to detail when it comes to recording right. than I do. But having said that, I think what's important is ultimately the where you end up. And if you find yourself up against certain issues like the sound of a room and you can't get past that, um, then that's probably something that's important. And if, uh, if you end up making something that you really like and the drums are recorded in a terrible sounding room, but the end result is that it all works, then, uh, that, then everything's good. That's my take. Amen. I agree with that. So here's my last question for you, Justin, which is if you could record anyone, living or dead, using Reaper, who would it be? Uh, I would, I mean, because then that means you also get to see them play, right? So I would definitely go, uh, I'd probably go Led Zeppelin. Wow. I would like to see that too. Uh, they would sound good in this room, let me tell you. John Bonham would feel right at home. All right, Justin, okay. uh, we've been pretty comprehensive. Anything else uh, you want to bring up? Nah, it's, no, it's been a pleasure. All right, well, thanks, Justin. Thanks to all of you for listening in on this edition of Sonic Scoop on video. So we'll see you out there. Remember what Reaper looks like. That's the man. Justin, <laughs> thanks again, and uh, we'll Thank see you. you all soon.